So, right, fine. Uh, so as usual, I want to give you a brief overview of what we uh, did last time. It was second order design, right? Uh, and uh, uh, why uh, second order system is uh, so important? Because as you saw, after going through the process, the second order system can be mathematically analyzed to a great deal, right? To a great depth. Uh, the response of a second order system can be clearly derived in terms of uh, the rise time, the overshoot, the settling time, and things like that. Those are the parameters that you use to describe the response. Whether the response is good, bad, whatever, right? These are the parameters. And also, if you look at the industry, you always get these parameters saying that, okay, your overshoot cannot be uh, more than a certain uh, uh, limit. And also the, the rise time has to be this much, not more than that, or the settling time, the response has to settle before a certain uh, maximum time and things like that. Uh, so then your uh, problem is to design your control system accordingly. Uh, but this is not possible in other systems except for the second order system. That is why uh, it is so important. I think we went through uh, the entire design process last week, right? So we were able to uh, uh, relate the, the response to uh, the system uh, elements, right? Through a, a sequence, like for example, we, we first look at the two parameters, uh, damping ratio, which is zeta, you can see it over here and uh, uh, natural undamped frequency omega n, zeta and omega n, right? So the time domain parameters of the response, like as I said, overshoot, rise time, settling time, etc., right, uh, are directly related to zeta and omega n, zeta and omega n. So what is zeta, right? What is omega n? If you look at this whole uh, plane, right? Omega n is like radius. If you have a pole somewhere here, this is omega n, right? This is omega n. And uh, what is zeta? Zeta is the horizontal component of this one, right? And that ratio is zeta. If you look at omega, what is that factor? So if you stay above the real axis, Right. If you stay above real axis, you will have bigger omega n, right? And you have lower zeta, right? And uh, if you are very close to the real axis, right? Zeta is close to unity. Zeta is close to one. So here you can see the zeta change. If you are on the real axis, which means actually not you are actually on the real axis. Your imaginary part is very big. That is what it says, right? If you look at a pole like this, it has a real part and imaginary part. So if your imaginary part is very big, right? When you say imaginary part is very big, you are actually getting closer to being on the real uh, imaginary axis, right? So then your zeta is zero. But if your imaginary part is small, which means you are on the real axis, you are approaching real axis, then your zeta is one. So this is one way to look at zeta, right? If you have a very high imaginary part, zeta is nearly zero. But if you have a, a very high real part, real negative, zeta is close to one, so like that. So this is how you understand the, the nature. So with that, uh, there is another thing I want to tell you that is 
when you have your poles located on the plane somewhere and you know you have the real part and the imaginary part so if you look at the imaginary part and the total length of the uh, the pole right so there you see this relationship where this omega d term comes in omega n to omega d so omega d is the actual imaginary part of the pole right uh, coming from the trigonometry process from omega n so you can say omega n cos this angle huh? so omega n sin this angle whatever it is this uh, modifier right from omega n to omega d right uh, depends on zeta how much your zeta is so therefore you can have a very high omega n but actually low omega d because of the effect of zeta all right if the zeta is uh, uh, close to zero uh, your your omega n and omega d uh, they are similar to each other but uh, if your uh, zeta is closer to 1 uh, you can have very high omega n but very small omega d because of that so this omega d is actually the damped uh, frequency of the of the plant which means if you look at your response and if you record it using an oscilloscope or something and you calculate your frequency that you see if there's any oscillatory part it may be dying oscillation right you can see this frequency radians per second and that is omega d usually omega n cannot be uh, observed right using an oscilloscope but you can record what you can observe is omega d right Okay, I think this uh, understanding is uh, extremely important, right? If you understand what I just explained, I think you know everything about second order systems. So now we are with omega n and zeta. So when I say omega n, now you know omega d also. So these two parameters, omega n and omega d and uh, zeta uh, can be related to the response uh, parameters like for example rise time or settling time overshoot on one hand on the other hand theta and omega n are related to the poles understand so therefore this is a three step process you have uh, your poles then you know your theta and omega n and then you know your rise time settling time overshoot etc or the other way around if you know okay what you want uh, your rise time your settling time overshoot then you can calculate your zeta n, uh, n omega n and zeta and omega d whatever it is and then you can calculate the, your poles understand so after that you have to design your feedback loop to bring the poles to those locations so this is how the whole system works i think we went ahead and derive the equations and finally we got these equations right uh, and then this is the uh, final outcome of the process uh, if i know uh, what uh, rise time i need to have what uh, overshoot i need to maintain and what uh, settling time is required uh, i can eliminate some of these areas from the whole plane and then figure out okay what are these white areas right so that i have to place my poles in these white areas closer to the boundary right if i do any feedback gain tuning so that to bring the poles somewhere closer to, to this line i'm done right so this is the summary of uh, what we did last time i haven't given you an assignment i will send it to you tomorrow i will post it on the uh, the model and you will get an immediate uh, uh, email to download that document right uh, so uh, please work that out within the week and submit uh, by the end of the week right then the uh, other thing i want to tell you to wrap up this discussion on second order system is uh, this uh, most of the uh, 
plants that you see in your in, in different industries, right? Uh, what do you think about the order of these plants? Second order, third order, fourth order, fifth order. So there are different types of plants out there, right? Uh, now there is this process called dimension reduction, which means you can always do this. Uh, you can uh, reshape, uh, let's say, a, a fifth order plant to a um, third order plant by eliminating two of the poles in the system. If you think that these two poles are um, uh, this area along the real axis, farther down towards the negative infinity side, you can reasonably uh, safely remove those two poles. So you will retain 95, 98% of the response without any change, even though you take these two poles out. So that is a good practice, therefore. Then you reduce your order of the system from fifth order to third order. And if you have, let's say, a third order plant and you see one of the poles is uh, very fast and you really don't want to take that into account in the plant, you can take that out and it becomes a second order plant. So like that, uh, dimension reduction is something that you always do to reduce the plant complexity uh, without much compromise of the response accuracy of the plant, right? Your model need to represent uh, the plant right, as close as possible. Uh, but if you get rid of some of the poles, which are fast poles, therefore uh, there's uh, uh, no significant effect on the response, please do that. Then you are retaining with the minimum order plant, right, which retains 95% of the behavior, the response of the actual plant. So this process, if you apply this process and bring it down to a second order plant. So uh, how often is that possible? I, the answer is very often. Very often you can take a plant and figure out the second order approximation of the plant. Right? It's, it's generally possible. There are situations where this is not possible. So that we, let's eliminate that one. Uh, a lot of, lot of plants are there which can be approximately and reasonably modeled with second order plant. And also on the other hand, when people design systems, right, they always tend to design so that it matches with the second order model, right? Because they know what is uh, going to come, right? They need to uh, model the plant, uh, figure out the response, tune the controllers, a lot of things happening. So if you have a very, very complicated system, then of course you are in trouble, right? Uh, if it is a second order plant, uh, it is analytical and you can do a lot of things. On the other hand, there are complicated systems like airplanes, missiles, etc., ships, right, and modern cars with a lot of features in it. Uh, inherently complicated. You can't just simply say second order, right? In that case, your design technique has to be different and entirely on computer based design, right? Okay. Right, so that's about it for the second order plants. Uh, so if you have any questions about second order, please ask now, else I will start the next uh, lecture. All right, so, uh, so let me, uh, start with the other, the next lecture that is, as you can see the screen, a generic compensators. Generic compensators. And remember, this is kind of storytelling, right? Uh, we are going from one chapter to the other, right? And these chapter, chapters are uh, very elegantly connected. These chapters are not random, isolated chunks that we study separately. No, this is a very well connected sequence, right? So in, end of a certain lecture is actually the beginning of the next uh, chapter, right? So when we end up a chapter, we solve a problem and also we start working with another new problem. 
and the following chapter is actually to solve that new problem right so it provides a solution and also it raises another problem so it goes like that so every chapter is a solution as well as a new problem right solution for the previous chapter and the problem for the following uh, chapter so compensators now what is the problem we are having right now so we discuss a design problem just uh, just a while ago second order plan you reduce the plan to second order and then you design your control accordingly and you tune your gain so that uh, your poles get located uh, in the desired places so therefore apparently there's no big problem right it looks like uh, it's already done but it's not actually done there are anomalies right so if you just read through this one you will understand what the problem still remaining is problem of root locus design so as i said the root locus is a solution and sometimes uh, it can cause problems why root locus design can locate poles only on the root locus so that is why it is called root locus you know in the first place right so only on the root locus like for example when you drive a car you have to follow the road right if you can go off road but generally it's not the case right but if you want to get to another location you have to you have to pay the way to get there you have to create the road structure to go there right or else you have to bend the road so that it goes to the desired location right otherwise if you use sim simple gain tuning what we discussed earlier feedback gain when you tune the gain from zero to infinity right your poles get located right open loop poles remember open loop poles they start their journey towards open loop zeros when k is infinity or they have to go to infinity right along the asymptotes so that is the root locus design but um, at all times uh, the poles uh, are on the root locus which is the the curved lines right on the pole plane the poles cannot uh, move anywhere else but they just have to follow they simply follow the path okay that is why it is called root locus so uh the method cannot change the root locus and locate poles at desired locations if those desired locations are not on the existing root locus that is the problem now let's say you are you have a second order system you have the rise time you have the settling time or shoot and uh, you uh, you shade those areas on the pole plane and figure out okay the desired locations are here 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 and here right for the poles now you go back to your root locus and figure out my god these points are not on the root locus so what am i going to do the desired poles have already been calculated but those locations there is no path there is no root locus going through these points so therefore even if you try to tune up your gain from zero to infinity you are not going to get to those desired locations there is no such gain which brings uh, the poles to those locations because the root locus does not pass through those locations now you understand what the problem is with the root locus uh, please let me know uh, do you understand what the problem is with uh, the generic root locus method so this is the starting point of today's lecture the compensators hmm? yes or no can somebody uh, answer whether you understood uh, what the problem is uh, let me ask capriti pole
So do you understand what I just uh, explained? Guna Singha, Kalana Guna Singha. Do you understand yeah. what? Yeah, right, fine. Mustafa? Little bit, sir. Okay. Uh, what is not very clear to you? Actually, I couldn't concentrate much. All right, all right. Uh, uh, so you have to catch up the content, right? Uh, then uh, say on. Do you understand uh, what I just explained as to what the problem with uh, the root locus design? They are simple gain tuning. Uh, sometimes cannot bring the poles to your desired locations and therefore you cannot achieve desired response. Arya Tilaka. Palavatta. Sir, yes, sir, understood, sir. Understood, good. Sahan. Yes, I, I yes, sir. Okay. Ramesh. Yes, sir. Send the Nayaka. Yes, sir. I got the idea. Okay. Vikramatilaka. Vigitaran. Yes, sir. I got that. Okay. Nazif. Yes, sir. I, I, I understood. Right. Okay. So many of you, I think, have understood uh, what the problem is. So it is extremely important to know what the problem is, why we are doing this and all, right? Okay. Now the second bullet. Generic compensators. We call it, let's say, CES. Right below, you can see this block diagram. This is the open loop plant. This is the sensor. You can have a gain here. But this is the first time you see something like this, another block in front of the open loop trans function, right? We call it the compensator. So actually, today's lecture is about uh, compensators, generic compensators, all right? So compensate is another block in front of the plant. You can, it's an electronic uh, device. It can be a RLC circuit, resistors, caps and inductors, okay? Or it can be a microcontroller based circuit, whatever it is. Then it process some signals and then send another signal to the plant. Okay, it is an artificially designed thing. So these generic compensators are used in, in, in those situations in order to change the existing root logos. There you are. Right? If you know that your uh, uh, so let's say this is your pole plane, right? and your poles, oops. Right, so let's say uh, you have one pole here, right? And the root locus is, uh, is like this, right? The other one is like this. So then you are done. 
you just need to figure out okay what is your what is my k uh, what is my k which brings this uh, point uh, right what is my k right what is my k to bring the pole here however if you decide pole is somewhere here right there is no such k right which brings the pole to this location the desired location right so you can get maybe somewhere over here so will it solve the problem if it solve the problem and if you think okay this is approximately okay then okay fine you can go ahead and leave it there and calculate what what k will bring the pole here and you are done but you will not have your required overshoot maybe overshoot is a little too much you want to have five percent now you have eight percent your rise time your settling time they also have different values than what what you expect if you really want to achieve uh, precisely the overshoot settling time rise time and those parameters you have to uh, bring you this pole to this location this location so for that what you need to do is to bend the root lockers right change the root locker so that it goes like this right so changing the root locus changing the root locus from the existing uh, locus to a new right one like this right so changing it like this is done by uh, this compensator. This compensator. So the purpose of bringing a compensator, which is uh, another block in front of the open loop trans function, will do just that. It will change the root locus from existing. Uh, uh shape and it it will pull right it in such a way that the modified root locus will pass through the desired uh pole location so once you do that then you have to tune your gain right there is a particular gain which will bring uh the open loop pole right onto this point is open loop pole i always say open loop pole is the starting point of the root locus and then when you tune k the pole will move so then again you don't you don't call it open loop pole it is the pole of the closed loop plant right it goes like that like that and eventually stop here so then you figure out your k right and you fix it at that value your poles will be located here these are the desired values not on the actual original uh, root locus, but this is the modified root locus. So who modified the root locus? The compensator modified the root locus. So this is simply uh, the answer to the problem of uh, desired poles not being on the existing root locus. So you need to bring a compensator to fix the problem. So there are three generic compensators we use uh, for this purpose face lag face lead and notch so today we are going to talk about these three compensators right any questions so far yes sir, can you hear me yes go ahead so the today's lecture is based on the chapter seven of the book right yeah yeah i think so chapter seven yes Server controller design. Uh, no, just look at the uh, the title, not the number. Can be six or seven or eight. Doesn't matter. Compensators. 
the current lecture slide is not available in the site i think today's lecture okay i'll check that out and upload if it is not there it's about compensators right not the server design server design comes a bit later yeah so there's a chapter by the name uh, compensators right generic compensators so you need to read that chapter okay i think on the course website uh, it was there for quite some time not recently it has been there for a long time uh, check uh, the neighboring uploads right you can figure it out it should be there somewhere for whatever reason if it is not there so i'll fix that problem any other questions okay so remember there are, there are three uh, compensators lag lead and notch lag lead and notch right so right so let me first uh, take one of these things face lead compensator so i want to take the lead compensator first so lead compensator is something like this it is a very simple block s plus z over s plus p so it's a one zero and one pole there's one zero there's one pole okay but the nature of this lead compensator is that you always have your pole right to the left of zero pole is to the left of zero so when you do that if you if you pick up a point on the plane let's say s somewhere here arbitrary point if you draw the line to the zero you get this angle this is the face angle you get from the zero and also if you draw a line to the pole here you get this angle theta p theta p is the angle phase angle you get from the pole now as you know in a block like this uh, the angle from uh, the zero is positive angle from the pole is negative because it's in the denominator right complex number theory so the net phase angle of the lead compensator is a big positive angle and not so big negative angle so all together is a positive value this minus this this is a big angle so therefore you get a net positive phase angle contributed to the transfer function by the compensator because this is a phase lead adding phase to the plant positive net positive phase addition to the plant uh, that's the name lead lead composite okay that is that is why it is called lead composite lead means positive phase addition to the plant now as you know the very definition of root locus is that uh, on the root locus right there's a phase condition right the total phase is plus or minus 180 degrees now if you bring this compensator into the plant right you are bringing additional phase to the plant right so therefore uh, the points that satisfy the phase condition now are different from those points the plant uh, satisfied the phase condition earlier so therefore you have changed the root locus now that, that that's i think understandable right this little block block in front of the open loop plant will change the root locus will change the root locus 
that's for sure because it has this phase component the condition for root locus is is not going to change right it is the total phase plus or minus 180 degrees right so to appreciate the lead compensator let's work out an example right let's work out an example so look at this one uh, open loop transfer function of a system is this so i give you this one 1 over s plus 2 s plus 3 so it is the open loop plant it has two poles one is at uh, minus 2 the other one is at minus 3 two poles right open loop so now we are going to uh, design a feedback loop right with a gain and uh, you are supposed to uh, uh, satisfy these conditions 4% overshoot in your step response 4% overshoot so it goes like that right but it cannot go more than 4% let's say and also 1% settling time of 1 second so the settling time should be 1 second right and after one second whatever variation in the response so because this is going like this ringing it goes up and down but this up and down thing should should be dropped should drop to one percent in one second so can you achieve these conditions so let's see so take a piece of paper so work with me right then you can learn a lot of things as we as you go through the lecture so first thing i do is this i want to uh, close the loop this is the plant one over s plus two s plus three feedback through the ideal sensor again this is summing point reference and response right so this is my plant i'm trying to achieve these conditions 4% overshoot and one second uh, settling time okay uh, so i can draw the root locus like this initially how without any modification done to the plant right if i just go by this because this is my first approach right close the loop tune the gain get the result so that is my first approach so the uh, root locus condition for the plant is 1 plus k gshs equals 0 remember root locus rule 1 plus k gs which is this one hs which is 1 is equal to 0 so eventually it will be 1 plus k times this one 1 over s plus 2 s plus 3 equals 0 So, I can calculate zeta and omega n because I know the overshoot has to be 4%. So, it is 0 0.04. Overshoot as a fraction, 0 0.04, 4% overshoot. And also, here you can see the rise time of one second remember this is a rise rise time equation 4.6 over rise time times damping ratio so damping ratio can be calculated directly from the overshoot this is from the previous lecture you substitute here the overshoot and calculate zeta and put it over here to the rise time calculate your omega n so in in two equations here you calculate zeta and omega in both now when you have zeta and omega n you can calculate your poles let me call it gamma 1 and gamma 2 right they are zeta omega n plus or minus j omega n square root 1 minus zeta square so substitute for zeta and omega n and this is your answer this is a second order plant 
these are the four locations minus 4.6 plus or minus j 4.43 right now this is the actual root of this where you have two poles minus 3 and minus 2 when you increase your gain like this one here k these two poles move head on and this they meet here 2.5 one goes up the other one goes down this is your existing root locus how do you draw this in matlab you have to solve this uh, 1 plus or gs or 1 plus kgs feedback loop right and figure out the transfer function and this is a simple one keyword r locus of the transfer function you get the root locus right a couple of lines in matlab any open loop plan given to you in few lines you can draw the root locus right in in matlab now the problem is if you check the desired poles minus 4.6 now let me let me figure out on the real axis is 1 1.5 2 2.5 3 3.5 4 4.5 4 4.6 somewhere over here and then the imaginary part 4.46 if you go like that right so this is uh, uh, somewhere or very far somewhere here so actual uh, pole location would be somewhere where you see this uh, laser pointer this is the desired point right desired uh, closed loop pole and there's another one on the negative side right you can clearly see the difference between the existing root locus and the desired pole location the existing root locus is now going vertically up and vertically down and none of these lines go through the desired pole right which is this one 4.6 minus plus or minus this part so this is where you see uh, the the problem and you now conclude that this is not going to work this simple feedback gain k no matter how hard you try you, you're not going to go through the desired pole which is this one pole pair rather then you go to the next level where you understand that the existing root locus should be bent to the left this existing root locus should be bent to the left until it passes through the desired point this one so whenever you want when you whenever you see the root locus and um, you need to bend it to the left think about the lead composite so this is exactly what the lead composite does it bends uh, the root locus to the left so like this lead compensator bends the root locus existing one to the left so now we are in a, in such a situation right okay so now we bring in the lead composite now you can see it over here this is the plant this is the lead compositor and as you know lead composite is s plus is a do s plus p one zero one four the rest remains the same So now we have to calculate ZP and also this K. If you can calculate what is Z, what is P, then you know what your lead compensator is. And if you calculate K to bring the poles to the desired location, that is this one, you're done. So to do that, we go to the next step where we uh, write the characteristic equation with the lead compensate right it is one plus k gshs in fact uh, uh, the uh, uh, 
uh, root locus condition is equal to zero. Now this time, instead of Gs, which is this plant, you have S plus is it uh, over S plus P also. So that is why this S plus is it and S plus P comes over here. One plus K Gs. Now Gs is the whole thing, right? This uh, compensator becomes a part of the open loop. Now. And you know that uh, this uh, phase condition, this root locus condition, right, has two forms, magnitude and phase condition. And we take the phase condition, which is this one. Total angle here is the angle of the numerator minus angle of the denominator, like this, the total angle should be plus or minus 180 degrees, right? And this condition should be satisfied, right? At this point. So you can take one of these points, one of these roots or poles, right? And at that point for S, right? This condition should be satisfied. In that, if it is the case, we know that the root locus passes through these points. I think uh, it is a very important that you don't have any confusion here. I, this is a bit complicated discussion we are engaged in right now. For the root locus, right? For any point to be on the root locus, this condition has to be satisfied. The phase condition has to be satisfied. Now we want to bring the root locus through this point. So which means this point should satisfy the root locus condition, the phase condition. So we have to calculate our S, Z and P in order to achieve this requirement that this particular point, when you apply it over here, this condition should be satisfied then you know that the root locus passes through this point. How do we do that? This is how we do that. So, uh, the phase condition, if you look at the phase condition here, you can see three poles. One is at minus three, the other one is at minus two, the other one is at minus P, and one zero, which is at minus Z. So, I draw them all here, minus two, minus three, minus P, and minus Z. Where is minus Z? I don't know. I'm going to figure that out. Where is the zero? Right. Oh, you can say, right. I will uh, place the zero and calculate the pole, right. So you have only one equation. You cannot solve two parameters, two unknowns using one equation. So you can arbitrarily uh, fix one of these two, either Z or P, and then calculate the other one. That's okay. It's a design problem. Design is not unique here. Design is not unique here. There are multiple designs leading to the same outcome, okay? So let's uh, pick up arbitrary zero at minus four. You can pick up something else, doesn't matter, right? So now I'm going to ask you to do that. You have a piece of paper, right? I have located the zero at minus four. You can locate at a different point, minus five, minus six, minus 4.5, whatever it is, right? Once you locate it, then you see this bubble here, minus four. And this is your pole. We don't know the position, right? Uh, so this is, we don't know, question mark, right? You are going to find this pole. And uh, zero, right, this one. So we have figured out. We arbitrarily place the pole uh, zero here and want to calculate the pole. 
Now we need to calculate the phase equation, this one, right? Uh, for a point, any point, if you if you if you take any point S from S2 minus 2, what is the angle? S2 minus 3, what is the angle? S2 0, what is the angle? S2 P, what is the angle? So you have to calculate all these four. One, two, three, four. And three of them are negative. This one is positive, right? So angle coming from the zero, this one is positive. These three are negative. So theta is it. This angle is positive and all the other angles are negative. Theta P, theta one and theta two. So why don't you take uh, this exercise, right? And calculate the total phase. Calculate the total phase, right? For this point, minus 4.6 plus J4.43. Because this is the point, this is the desired pole location in order to achieve the overshoot and rise uh, settling time condition. Right? If the root locus goes through this point, you marginally achieve the desired response. So the point S we figure out here is uh, actually minus 4.6 plus J 4.43. So for that one, right, calculate the total phase and uh, equate it to plus or minus 180 degrees, right, and calculate. Uh, the pole value here. So I have done partly here, right? The process, I want you to continue. I don't, I, I want you to continue, right? You can use minus four for zero or prefer, I prefer if you select something else, minus five, minus 4.5 or something like that. So please take five minutes to calculate uh, the pole for a given zero. Take five minutes and do that. I'll check your answers. All right. Uh, how many of you have uh, been able to calculate uh, the compensator? So compensator is basically zero and a pole. And here, in this particular case, zero is uh, located at minus four, right? Then what is remaining to be done is to calculate the pole location, P. And uh, what we use here is the phase condition of the root locus, that is theta is it minus theta one, theta two, and theta P, right? should be equal to plus or minus 180 degrees. So if you get theta is at this angle, this is 180 minus this angle. So 180 minus tan inverse, the height is 4.43, uh, the base is uh, 4.6 minus four. So that is 0.6. So likewise, you continue, right? With the other ones, theta P, for example, we don't know. We just leave it there, theta P. Uh, theta 1 and theta 2 also can be calculated just like you did over here for theta is it right one of these things would be 180 minus tan minus 4.43 over 1.6 so 1.6 is from here to here right 4.6 minus 3 as the base so that is angle theta 2 then when it comes to theta 1 it is tan inverse 4.43 over 2.6 because this is from 2 to 4.6 is the base. So it's very simple. So now uh, this inverse tangent, these angles, right, you can calculate and put it over there to get this one 180 minus 82.3. Theta P remains theta P. Uh, this is uh, 70.1, uh, 59.6. So when you simplify, right, can go through number of steps and finally calculate your theta p, 47.4 degrees. 
47.4 degrees. So this has to be 47 degrees. Okay. Now 47.4 degrees is actually tan inverse 4.43 over P minus 4.6. You know that. This is P, this is 4.6, uh, the vertical. So P minus 4.6 is the base for this inverse tangent. So you can write it like that, tan inverse 4.43 over P minus 4.6. So this way, you calculate your P, 8.66. So if you select uh, your zero at point four, uh, at minus four, your pole will be 8.66. Had you selected a zero to some other value, pole would have been a different value as well. Okay. So th therefore, in order to get this phase contribution, right, needed for this point to be on the root locus can be achieved through an infinite number of combinations of zeros and poles. So that is why I said it is infinite number of solutions leading to the same outcome. So your design would be different from others design, but everybody leads to the same rise time, overshoot, etc. In the in the response. Okay. Now, once you design, you have to simulate it in MATLAB and verify your result, right? So this is that part. And you can see here, if you are not pretty good in math, uh, MATLAB right now, you can see some of these codes and get a photo of the screen, right? And code it immediately, right? And see it for yourself and build your confidence, right? Working with MATLAB. Uh, so your plant now, uh, with the compensator has a zero and three poles. Zero and three poles, right? What is the zero? Minus four. So when you have a zero at minus four, you take this uh, minus four to the left-hand side of the equation, it becomes plus four. So S plus four is your numerator. S plus four is your numerator. Okay, so remember some... Some people, uh, this is also a problem, right? Uh, to figure out this sign. So when I say, right, S equals, oops. When I say S equals, uh, minus four, this is my zero, right? I can take this four to the left hand side and say S plus four. Right, so I say S plus four, right, as a, one bracket here. So uh, <clears throat> this s plus four is the is the numerator of the open loop transfer function, right? And the denominator has uh, uh, three poles, right? Uh, one is the pole from the uh, compensator at minus eight point six six. I think this one, right? Uh, the pole from the uh, 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 the, the composite, right? P equals 8.66, but it is minus P over here, minus P, okay? Right. So, uh, this is how we write numerator in the uh, in, in MATLAB, one plus four, which means it's plus four actually, right? And then the denominator, you have three uh, elements, three poles, one is 8.66, the other one is two, the other one is three. These are open loop poles and the compensator pole. So it is always easy to write it like that. And then 
create your denominator create your denominator using this convolution function you can see it over here denominator 2 which is 1 2 denominator 3 which is 1 3 you combine them together like this and the result you convolute with this one 1 point one time one and eight point double six that is then one denominator one denominator two denominator three you combine them together to produce the denominator okay now you have the numerator here you have the denominator you use the command called transfer function tf with two arguments numerator and denominator this is the open loop numerator open loop denominator this is the open loop transfer function with the compensator. So I give it a name CG, compensator, and G. G is the open loop transfer function. So you have to, in MATLAB, before you can use the transfer function, you have to declare and construct your transfer function, open loop transfer function. That is why you write numerator and the denominator like that, then use the convolution to combine these individual first order blocks in the numerator or in the denominator or in, the, in both and then use tf command transfer function command right and give the arguments numerator denominator uh, to create the transfer function and give it a name cg after that you can use it uh, on the root locus uh, keyword right root locus within bracket cg so then this command will create the root locus of the transfer function, which is over here. You can see it on your right. Okay. Now see how different it is from what it was. This is what it was. Minus two, minus three are the poles. It is a second order system. And it was very simple. Now it has become like this. In addition, in addition to the, the first two poles, minus two, minus three, now you have a new pole, a zero and a pole. This is minus four, zero. This is 8.66, the new pole. And as a result of that, so these two poles uh, move head on and meet up over here. And one goes north like this, the other one goes down like this. And this pole will start its journey along the real axis, end up at the zero here. So it is a different uh, system now. Now it is a fourth order system, a third order system from original second order. So there is this uh, uh, controversy here. Our parameters like um, overshoot, uh, rise time, everything we uh, uh, design based on the second order plant. Now we are using the same thing on a third order plant, right? So this is the very nature of control systems. You don't have the mathematical precision here. This is, this is more like an applied engineering, right? We want to control a plant. And uh, even if we say 4% overshoot, if you ask from the person who asks you, well, how did you get this four point overshoot? 4% overshoot. He probably is not very sure about it. It can be 4.5, it can, can be even 5, it can be 3.5 as well. So all these things are estimates or desired, preferred numbers. So if you become little imperfect, uh, it's acceptable and use your third order system now with the compensator and still use the second order parameters and figure out how close or how far you can get, right, from the original spec. If you can still stay very close to it, that's fine, that's fine. So don't try to be mathematically uh, precise in here. This is control systems, right? You use mathematics as only means to do something that is controlling your plant in a desirable way, okay? Right. So now, as you can see, if you follow this line now in, in MATLAB, while in MATLAB, you can actually uh, check this point, which uh, this black square here, right? When you get there and click your right hand button, 
you can see this pop-up box which tells you the information at that point the first one that you see is gain equals 32.8 gain is 32.8 which means there is this feedback gain here this k so when you when you change this k to 32.8 or maybe 33 right your closed loop pole is over here exactly at this uh, uh, minus 4.6 plus j 4.46 you, you don't need to get this close right uh, but in this particular case you, you get exactly to that point and you can see it here uh, the gain that brings you there is 32.8 now this is quite an uh, achievement uh, you have designed a phase lead compensator and attach it to the plant and then figure out your gain to bring the poles to the desired location. Okay. So that's fantastic. Now, if you look at the closed loop transfer function, which is GS over one plus KGS, usually, uh, the the typical feedback loop now with the compensator right uh, the gs becomes csgs okay so cs goes everywhere right with gs now gs is not going along anywhere it's always compensator and g cg together so this is the new uh, compensated uh, closed loop transfer function. So, uh, you need to adjust your DC gain now because the new compensator might have changed your DC gain. So, therefore, why don't you calculate your uh, DC gain of the plant? So, this is the equation for that. Limit S goes to zero, the transfer function. CS, GS, 1 plus K, CS, GS. So, uh, it is like this, right? Uh, as S goes to zero, right? The answer is 0 0.02, whatever it is, right? This one. Uh, 4K equals 33. 4K equals 33. Now, this is about 2% of the input. So you want to adjust it by getting the reciprocal of that, right? Turn it upside down. And then you see it's like 40 something, right? 46 to be exact. Put that as a gain in front of the whole thing. So which means you increase or amplify your signal reference by this factor because you know the remaining closed loop will uh, reduce the DC gain to about 2%. So together you can maintain the unity DC gain. Now once you do that, you again have to simulate. Now you can see this code here. The purpose of uh, showing you this code is actually for you to actually one to one type it if you are not familiar with MATLAB and get going, right? There are so many uh, codes like that. I'm giving every uh, uh, lecture and um, uh, it's not just for the presentation it's for your actual typing uh, using matlab and see it for yourself right so i'm going to simulate for three seconds that is why duration is three i know my k is 33 to bring the poles to the desired locations numerator is one four this is just one single zero at minus four and denominator, I have three poles, open loop poles. One is minus 8.66. The other one is minus 2. The other one is minus 3. And this is my transfer function. Now I make the feedback loop. Earlier, I didn't do that. Earlier, it was transfer function command, which brings to me, which creates the open loop transfer function numerator over denominator. Okay. 
Now it is different. After I create the transfer function GS, I have to create the feedback loop. So for that, there is a command feedback and two arguments G and K. G is the open loop transfer function, which comes from here, and K is the feedback gain. Gain is already calculated as 33. So understand how MATLAB works also, right? The same process. Clear? So you first figure out your numerator, denominator, and then make your open loop transfer function and then your closed loop transaction using feedback keyword. And now you know the feedback loop is only up to uh, only this point, right? This gain is not part of feedback loop. So you need to multiply with 45.99, the system, feedback system, and then simulate it, it for duration, that is uh, three seconds. Okay, and put the grid on. Then you will see this one. Then you will see this one. So this is the step response. You can see it goes like this. There is an overshoot and then uh, settle down. And now check your peak is actually 1.06. It's a 6% overshoot, overshoot, not 4%, 6%. But this is close enough for you to do final trial and error final tuning if you really want to get down to four now you can adjust it a little bit change k slightly right until you get this to four percent okay so getting close enough is the purpose here not to the exact uh, uh, requirement getting as close as possible and after that anyway in control systems you have to do trial and error because control systems are actual systems in, in, in physical world and those actual plans will not comply with our mathematical equations which are simplified version of the reality so therefore whatever you uh, derive on paper or uh, in MATLAB can only be close enough to the reality and when you apply all these controls uh, whatever in real systems you always see the differences then you have to do trial and error. So that is why it is important to get close enough to the reality so that the remaining trial and error process, you can make it perfect. Now, if you look at the settling time, 1% settling time is, is roughly there, one second. It's, it's almost there, yes. Right. Any questions so far? Because we are going to get a break now. Please ask if you have any questions now. Sir? Yeah. But I couldn't understand that. We uh, are adding the to, to system for 46, the K value. Yeah, so 46 uh, comes over here. It's not part of the lag uh, phase lead design. So this is the lead compensator, right? Uh, in order to get your. Uh, uh price time or oh, sorry the settling time and the overshoot right as required but when you do that this is something additional that we do in order to bring the response to sizable uh, level without this one your response will be only two percent of what you require right let's say you have the step uh, response step means one right and if you go to the output side and see what you get it's only uh, 0 0.02 only two percent of the level come out as the response so that is why you need this uh, pre-gain here we call it pre-gain you calculate the dc gain of the plant using this equation dc gain of the plant right 0 0.02 you know it is a very very attenuated response and then you amplify your input signal by the reciprocal of the DC gain so that you get unit response here right getting unit response that is one is the requirement here so when you put one here you get one here 
To make that happen, you need to have this 46 gain up front. Feedback gain is anyway 33. It's after that you get this one here. See, it's level one because of this 46. Because of this 46. Is that clear? Any other questions, please? Sir, uh, can you please explain how we can get the feedback here equal to 33? Right. There are two ways. Easier way is look at this one, MATLAB. On the screen, you follow the line and clicking at various points. Click over here, click over here, click over here. When you do that, this pop up box will appear and tell you what gain will bring you there. So here you can see gain is 32.8. This gain is the feedback gain, this K. That is how we know third grade. The second method is the gain formula of the root locus. Remember, root locus has two formulas, phase and gain, this one phase and gain. To this equation, if you substitute S equals this one, uh, what, what is that? Uh, this one, minus 4.6 plus J 4.43. One of the poles, you substitute over here and you can calculate K, magnitude, okay? It's a complex number. You calculate the gain of K and it will be 33. Is that right? Is that clear? Yes. Right. Any other questions, please? Sir, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Sir, last week I didn't uh, come to the class, so uh, I was unable to find the recording lecture also. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. I could not uh, upload these are big files and uh, sometimes it takes time. So uh, I'll definitely do that tomorrow or day after, right? This lecture and the previous uh, few uh, videos, but for all together. I will upload tomorrow or day after, right? Okay. Thank you. The notification email. Excuse me, can you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. So in the seventh slide, in the slide seven. Seven, yes. Yeah, if you take uh, minus two as a zero arbitrary, sorry, the answer should be same, right? No, no, no. Whatever you select for zero, there is a corresponding pole. Now this pole 8.66 is for minus 4 for 0. You, I think you understand that, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you if you change minus 4 to someone else, uh, you will get P something else as well, not 8.66. So but they are all okay. Then you go to MATLAB and uh, put it there, right? Uh, this 4 will be whatever value you put uh, for 0 and this is whatever value you get for the pole and continue the same lines and you will see pretty much the same uh, uh, root locus with very small uh, deviation but they will all go through this point. Any other questions, please? I think it's getting very interesting, right? Uh, we have different uh, ideas. Different, so in that uh, calculation. Questions. Yes. So in, in that calculation. Yes. Uh, that K equals zero, how we come to that decision like that? K equals zero. Where did you get that from? That 
Ah, the, this one, 180 with this, this yes, phase sir. condition, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, so when you reach your left-hand side, just watch what is coming up, what is being developed on the left-hand side, right? See, what is being developed on the left-hand side? See these numbers, 180, 70, 59. Do you see this is going over loops? And eventually it is theta p minus uh, 132, whatever, right? So no, it's just within one loop. If it passes one loop, of course, then you have to fix the simple key accordingly, right? You, you become the lead controller in here, right? Don't let just mathematics control you. You control mathematics, right? This K is in your control, in, in your hand. You can set it the way you want, looking at what is developing on the left-hand side. If it goes beyond 360, okay, pick up K2, uh, sorry, one. Uh, otherwise, keep it zero, right? So th that's how it works. So I think the best thing to remember is that uh, uh, here theta p minus 132.6, whatever, uh, k equals zero is the best match for this one. Big, even though there are other things, k equals one, two, three, right? Going through loops. Uh, obviously, you know, if you want to make theta p very big number, right, 42.4, when you set k equals to another one, you are only adding here another 180 decrease. So there's no way you can realize at one 360 degrees to theta p, right? So if you look at this one, right, you can bring it this point and keep it there and take p uh, to the negative infinity, right? Or this way to make it bigger, right? So. You, you can do that, but it will be very awkward. And the moment you pass this point, things become unstable, okay? So therefore, I think the wise decision is to keep it as simple as possible, right? And if you look at the numbers, I think K0 is the, the solution here. This equation has been prepared not because it is uh, essential to write it that way. This is for you to pick up and reduce some of these additional winding, right? And eliminate that part and get down to the first, first round, right? Get, get to the first round to avoid the second round. So that means in mathematically say, if I get something like uh, minus TP minus 300, uh, Mm. Or something like That's 400, right. something like that, then we can fix That's the K2. Right. Exactly. One. To to get yeah. one, one 360 degrees out of the equation, you adjust K. In order to remove 360 degrees out of the equation, for whatever reason, if you get that number, you adjust K in order to get rid of the problem. That's also a good question, yes. Yeah, I think I enjoy these questions. Any other questions? All right, fine. So then uh, let's take a break here, about 10 uh, minutes, right? And after that, we'll start the lag composite design. Okay. Uh, so after the lead compensator, it is the lag compensator, right? Now with uh, the understanding um, about the lead compensator, uh, you can figure it out what the lag, lag compensator is. Uh, so, Uh, this is actually the like compensator where the pole is to the right of zero. So the zero is actually the positive phase, 
now it is smaller uh, all is actually creating negative phase uh, that is bigger now so therefore uh, you have a net negative phase added to the plant so earlier you saw when you add, add phase to the plant uh, the root locus bent left this one root locus bent to the to, to the left which is basically a good sign because you, you are trying to be away from the real axis the uh, imaginary axis this one getting towards the imaginary axis is not generally good because you get uh, more oscillations and you could sometimes be unstable as well so um, bending the root locus to the left is generally a, a preferred choice and here uh, because the pole is to the right of zero and because the net negative phase added to the plant you are actually bending the root locus to the right or towards the unstable region if you uh, want to bring in a lag compensator so therefore uh, lag compensators are not generally uh, a preferred choice as i have written here lag compensator is not commonly used because it reduces stability reduces stability which means you are getting a bit closer to the imaginary axis right so in in designing control systems uh, uh, you you uh, want to make the system stable right so between stable and unstable uh, scenarios it's a very fine line okay and you don't want to go to even close to being unstable so how far away you are from the imaginary axis is important and that is kind of margin right uh, 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 before you make the system unstable so therefore stay uh, uh, sufficiently away from imaginary axis is important so any any modification in the plant let's say you you're changing your uh, component system component let's say in the shock absorber you you change your uh, spring you change your damper you change uh, whatever bushes or any other component and you are changing your, your your system right so the modifications that you introduce to the plant right whether it it actually makes the root locus bend to the left or to the right right so tells you uh, what sort of uh, changes you expect uh, in the response so it is how things work and if you design a lag compensator you have to be extremely uh, careful about it and see okay even though you move bend your root locus to the right and you still maintain sufficient margin right stability margin uh one good thing about lag compensator is this third one third bullet lag compensator improves dc gain that is that is a good thing to illustrate that we can mathematically figure it out and if you know um the dc gain of the plant it is basically as s goes to zero right the flow slope transfer function that is gso1 plus kgs so without any compensator if you just uh, calculate the dc gain of the plant it will be uh, this r over 1 plus kr where r is the limit as s goes to 0 gs so you take the limit of this one limit of that one basically r and r it is r over 1 plus kr okay so this is the dc gain of the plant but now with the compensator it becomes like this because now compensator goes wherever the the transfer function goes open loop gs so it is all both together now c and g here and here now as s goes to zero this uh, compensator as s goes to zero this becomes z over p z over p right if you look at the compensator as s goes to zero it is simply z over p so z over p 
So with the compensator, the DC gain is Z over PR or 1 plus K Z over PR. Now, if you further assume to figure out uh, what is happening to the DC gain because of the, uh, the lag compensator, right? You can further assume is it to be very big compared to the P, right? Don't have to be like that, but just to figure out uh, figure out the effect of the DC gain on the uh, the uh, the lag compensator on the DC gain, you can uh, uh, for a moment assume this. When you say it is very big compared with P, right? You can say this one is uh, meaningless, so that you can say it's a do P. R over is a over P R times K. So it becomes one over K. So in that situation, the DC gain is simply one over K. It doesn't depend on any, anything, but only the feedback gain. Now, if you compare these two together, this one versus this one, you can see this one is slightly bigger than this one. So that is why we say DC gain is improved by the lag compensator. In other words, the lag compensator uh, improve the low frequency response of the plant. That is another way to, to put that forward. It improves the low frequency uh, response. Right. So uh, we are not continuing the lag compensator in detail, right? Because we have done the lead compensator, which is the, the, the more common one. Uh, then we take the other one, the notch filter. Oh, there's a question uh, in the chat box. Uh, uh, when designing these types of uh, controllers, the additional addition of poles and zeros should be equal in quantity, or will there be unfavorable responses when the added number of zeros are higher than the number of poles placed? Of course, yes. Whatever you design and design, you should be able to build and uh, implement. So in that case, your denominator has to be equal or higher in order than the numerator, right? Otherwise, it, it won't be practically possible. You can simulate and do various things, but practically you can't implement that kind of uh, uh, system because then it is not kosher. It is not uh, kosher, right? Uh, that is why when we add uh, poles, there is a zero all zero and a pole come as. Uh, pairs and sometimes zeros, uh, number of zeros is less than number of poles, right? So, and here also you can see the same thing, right? Uh, the notch filter design. Uh, there's a background story for this one. Uh, read the first bullet here. Some plants show sustained oscillations, even with a properly designed controller, right? So this is the story. You have a plant and you model it and you design a feedback loop. You tune your gain. In your simulation, everything works pretty well. So you are happy. Then you design this controller and put it into the actual control, bring it to the uh, machine. And uh, when you try to control the plant, you see uh, typically, your average response is there, as you expect, but on top of that, there's an oscillation going on. There's some sort of ringing, sustained oscillation, right? So let's say there's a, there's a steady state level of the plant. So you have the steady state level average, but on top of that, there's a superimposed oscillation, right? Sometimes you see this kind of problems. Maybe this is because of uh, lubrication problem in the machine, 
maybe a, a bush is worn out um can be anything right be because we cannot model all these imperfections in the machine in the plant right so when you model a damper is a very simple model right actual damp damper behavior can be very complicated and if you uh, lubricate it or, be, or if you don't lubricate it response is going to change but how can you bring all these things to your mathematical model it becomes very complicated and uh, there's no such need also we want to have uh, the uh, components um, um, modeled with simple e equations right and uh, design feedback loop simulate that is how we do how the system works and then eventually you put it into practice and verify and at that point that point all of the anomalies the unmodeled dynamics the wear and tear of the machines right there's so many imperfections that will raise their heads at that point only you will see the anomalies the differences between your expected response and the actual response so if you can if you can get your uh, uh, get actual response uh, to be generally comply with the simulation result you have done a very good job right and and if your response is close enough that is also good because all what you need to do there on is to uh, do the do trial and error tune it up and get some reasonable response this is also another anomaly some sort of oscillation sustained oscillation it's not going to die out it's there right forever but it doesn't make probably a very significant problem uh, sometimes it could be uh, this uh, going up and down around otherwise the average response right so one explanation for that is that in your uh, uh transfer function right you have these two poles right that you did not know about these two poles you didn't know anything about these two poles now they are there because of the lubrication problem or maybe we are anti whatever it is right this uh, physical uh, change or status in the plant is actually represented by these two poles here but unfortunately in your model modeling process right they were not included so now in order to represent this oscillation sustained oscillation in the response you can introduce these two poles they are both on the real axis is a pair of imaginary pure imaginary poles so let's say j omega r j omega r plus minus r is for the kind of resonance sustained uh, oscillation so that is one thing that is the model side now the controller side how do we get rid of that one right because now it is anyway they are in the plant right so when you design your controller you have to model the plant as closely as possible we have done it but unfortunately we miss this behavior now we introduce it by way of these two poles okay i think you are following me now we go to the control part in order to cancel out this behavior what we do is we put another two zeros very close to them okay now when you have a zero and a pole very close to each other they cancel out their behavior right zero and pole they cancel out because zero is the numerator pole is the denominator so they cancel out even mathematically you can see that so this is what is called pole zero cancellation these two poles on the imaginary axis they produce sustained oscillation and the two zeros very close to them cancel out that effect so that you will get rid of this oscillation completely or to some extent so that is the technique here we call this a notch filter because notch means as you see uh, notch is is notch 
you know it's something like like this uh, right you have the flat curve up to this point and then the notch like this and this okay it's a notch so this is kind of frequency you can say right at that particular frequency right at that particular frequency you have this response reduce response right this is that particular frequency the omega r right you want to reduce your response at that particular point omega r when you have this notch the response goes down so that this, this oscillation will not appear so that is why it is called a notch filter right uh, when you say this word here this word filter it has uh, multiple meanings okay uh, in signal processing when you say filter it's like low pass high pass band pass notch etc uh, sometimes in the industry when you say filter they refer to a controller right and smoothing element and that kind of thing okay so <clears throat> now we can assemble the notch filter transfer function let me call it cns so what do you see there uh, i can see the two zeros these are the two zeros can you see that theta omega zero plus j omega r so this is uh, theta omega zero right and this is j omega r right so uh, uh, the two poles uh, sorry the two zeros like this and uh, uh, the two poles are here minus omega zero so again this point you can probably arbitrarily select uh, so s plus omega zero square two poles on top of each other because it's a free choice uh, rather than having two uh, poles at two different locations right um, this is uh, not a complete design but just to get rid of these two unnecessary poles right so uh, better put them together on top of each other right um, and then use omega zero with some zeta right to get this zero to a very close to the imaginary axis, right? So then theta becomes nearly one, uh, sorry, zero, right? Um, because this is a very small number then, very small negative number. So it's somewhere here. And then J omega R is the imaginary part. So this is as big as the frequency of oscillation, right? So this way you, you actually, you become the architect here right you design it properly the poles new poles coming up here and then the theta very close to zero so for whatever omega zero very very small value for zeta uh, will bring the zero close to the imaginary axis so so that's how you do that so this is our uh, notch filter trans function notch filter trans function Okay, we, we expect this to uh, cancel out this uh, J omega R pole here and here. And uh, in addition to that, it introduces this uh, two poles here, additional poles here, uh, omega zero. But make sure these two poles are farther away on the real axis so that uh, these poles are very fast poles. They don't, they are, they are not the dominant poles of the plant. This is another thing you need to remember in any plant. If you see, there are a number of poles, right? Some of the poles are dominant, some of the poles are non dominant poles. The poles that are closer to the imaginary axis are the dominant poles. Poles farther away are not the dominant poles. They are fast poles because they are fast. Uh, they don't appear, they don't uh, stay there for too long, right? And uh, therefore, they are not dominant. Dominant poles are the slow frequency poles closer to the imaginary axis, and they, are, they stay there, they show their presence 
right, uh, for a long time. So they, they are very visible in their response. So if you select uh, omega zero uh, big enough, then uh, the poles that you introduce to the plant are not dominant. So therefore you're not changing the system too much. Understand? So earlier I said to you, uh, uh, let's say your uh, plant is uh, fifth order, right? And the two poles are uh, very fast towards negative direction, farther away. Then you can simply take these two poles out uh, because they are not dominant poles, right? And if you want, if you uh, if you are going to introduce poles to a plant, like over here, you are supposed to introduce only the two zeros. But there's no way to introduce two zeros to a plant without having these two poles. So even though you don't like it, you have to do this. You are introducing two poles to the plant. So therefore, your choice is to make sure these two poles that you are going to add are not the dominant poles. So you have to place them farther away towards the negative infinity. Okay. So that way you can satisfy most of the conditions in a most uh, satisfactory, reasonable manner. Now let's go ahead with a notch filter design through an example, right? So I'm going to take the same uh, plant. Uh, we used to uh, uh, demonstrate the lead compensator, right? Uh, now let me take the plant uh, we already designed. So this uh, CSGS, one plus K C S G S, right? All these things. You can substitute for G S, substitute for C S. C S is the lead compensator, right? So this is the uh, transfer function, existing transfer function, okay? Yeah, there's a, there's a question in the chat box. Uh, the dominant uh, dominant in the sense that influence uh, that influence much in the system. Yeah, yeah, it is. So uh, remember one of the first lectures that we discussed. Uh, I said that every pole generates a response, a curve, a ripple, a wave, and when you add them together, when you add them together. You get the total response. So the response you see coming out of a plant is contributed by number of waves, number of components from one each uh, from each pole, right? So uh, some of the responses are big and uh, slow; they stay too long. So that is why we call them uh, dominant poles. Uh, uh, but if a pole is uh, non-dominant, which means they are fast, they are quick, their appearance is uh, uh, they last short term. You don't really see the response <clears throat> taking too long, persistent and slow, right? So that's why. Okay. So, uh, so this plant here is the lead compensated plant, lead compensated plant. Now, I am, I am going to introduce a two a troublesome poles here. See here, S square plus 100, what is that? When you say S square plus 100, this part, when you say this to zero, this part to zero, right? Uh, only this part, if you say this equals zero, right? Uh, S is minus J10, minus J10, which means a plus or minus J10, okay? So those are the two dominant, uh, two oscillatory poles, like this, like this, okay? This pole and this pole. So 
I have introduced two unmodeled poles to the plant to create this problem, right? To create this problem. Then I say uh, to compensate the plant, right? Uh, against this uh, oscillation, sustained oscillations, uh, I need to put a notch filter. And I say the poles and zeros of the notch filter, notch filter uh, are like this, minus one, plus or minus J10. So this is the pair of zeros. This is the pair of zeros to compensate for this one. Okay. I cannot place them exactly, but I place very closely. Then uh, the two poles, S equals minus 10 on the real axis, minus 10. Minus 10 is sufficiently far away from the imaginary axis. So these two poles are not the dominant poles, not the dominant poles. And these two zeros are close enough with these two poles so that it will uh, improve the response. Okay. The two zeros that you bring in have to be uh, close to the dominant uh, this uh, oscillatory poles right if you can get exactly on top of the poles so much the better but you don't have to being close enough is good enough now uh, the notch filter transfer function is this one s plus 1 minus j10 the other one is s plus 1 plus j10. So when you see these two, you can see the two zeros are there. So this zero, when you when you set this to zero, you can see minus 1 plus j10. This is minus 1 minus j10. Right? So these are the two zeros, this one and this one. And Below here, the denominator is S plus 10, S plus 10. So, which means this is the one of the, uh, the, the, the poles, the actual two poles on top of each other. Okay. So, then this is the entire transfer function for the notch filter. S square plus 2S plus 101 over S square plus 20S plus 100. So, we, we designed, this is a uh, uh, tentative design. So not notch filters are like that. You don't have to use uh, specific uh, equations to design this, right? Control systems, you 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 design your own. You go through a rational process and design, okay? Rather than deriving, okay? Now we have the uh, plant, original plant, the plant with the uh, uh, sustained oscillatory response. Right, this pair of uh, imaginary poles, and then we have the compensator notch filter. So everything is ready. Now, now it's like this. Right, this is the plant. Right, this is the plant, the lead compensator, the plant, and uh, now the plant is going to change with this one. Right, with this one, and then the notch filter comes over here. Notch field is S square plus 2S plus 10 over S square plus 20S plus 101. Fine. So uh, let's do the simulation here. Again, in MATLAB, duration is 3, 3 seconds. Uh, feedback gain already calculated, 33. And uh, uh, the pre-gain, 46 to uh, make the system uh, unity DC gain. And omega r, this is the resonant poles at 10 radians per second, right? This is the oscillatory response. This is our lead compensator already done. So I'm not going to introduce that again. And now our plant, I have the numerator one, denominator one, two, one, three. This is the open loop plant. Then uh, the, 
the the complete denominator is uh, denominator one two together so i create that one gs is the transfer function the open loop transfer function of the plant just the plant okay uh, then you have the the closed loop transfer function closed loop transfer function uh, with feedback open loop transfer function with k all right now you have the uncontrolled sustain oscillation which is the transfer function 1 1 0 uh, omega r square right this is the denominator right where you have two poles on top of each other that is why it is second order function a square right plus omega r square that is about 100 okay plus 100 a square plus 100 you write it like that so the number s to the one term s to the two term s to the three term like that a polynomial order so this is the uh, sustain oscillations uh, system with oscillations now when you have the total system with oscillation right uh, the plant the uh, the uh, PS is unmodeled sustain oscillations and also the closed loop plant and the pre gain G, right? Then you draw the response subplot 2 to 1. You know that already. You create the uh, display screen into 2 by 2 partition and you go to the first one. You draw the locus, root locus, system 1. So what is system one? The closed loop transfer function times PS, unmodeled oscillation. So there you can see some sort of oscillation there, right? Some sort of oscillation. So this is a closed loop transfer function uh, times the uh, uh, PS. PS is the unmodeled uh, oscillation. After that part comes is basically setting the axis, right? And put the grid on and uh, uh, the partition number two you have the step response for the plant step response then you go to the notch filter so this is the notch filter design one plus uh, one plus j omega r right this is the numerator the two zeros right uh, this one and this one and the numerator right uh, the two poles all right so <clears throat> the denominator is uh, so numerator one and two you you create separately and then you do the convolution to make the entire second order numerator denominator is like this right uh, this is where you have uh, uh, the, the two poles right of the notch notch filter then you have the numerator denominator going as two arguments to the transfer function command you create the notch filter now with the notch filter the system is going to change like this uh, this is one way i have fabricated right uh, in in reality it can be different if it happens to be like that but this is one way of simulating the whole thing. So I have the notch filter times the system. Notch filter times the system. This is the system. So in front of the system, you have the notch filter. And again, you use the subplot command, two by two partition. You go to the third one, you draw the root locus of the compensated plant. And you go to subplot four, Uh, subplot four and you draw the step response of the compensated plant so this is what you get this is what you get uh, you can see over here on the top left corner uh, uh, 
uh, it's not very clear here you can see one over here and here these are the two oscillatory poles here and here this one and this one you can see this crosses right and they give this oscillation huge oscillation okay huge oscillation and over here this is the compensated plant you can see uh, next to the uh, pole there's the pole there's a zero here and here also right is again not very apparent but you can see clearly uh, if you look hard right pole and zero pole and zero close to each other and somewhere over here this is the uh, minus 10 and the additional two poles uh, that uh, come together with the zeros right the notch filter and because of that these two zeros being very close to the oscillatory poles now you have something like this you can see if you compare these two responses together this is much better you have knocked off these uh, peaks right unnecessary oscillations this is not acceptable but maybe this is okay right oscillations are actually limited controlled but still there is a little oscillation because this compensation uh, zero and pole is not perfect so had the poles be right on top of the sorry had the zeros um, uh, uh, placed right on top of the poles this could have been completely resolved no oscillation at all but that, that is hardly possible in reality you can bring your uh, uh, zeros compensate the zeros very close to the poles but not right on top of them therefore this is what you get in a in a in such a situation it's not very easy to deal with right you can uh, you, it's difficult to eliminate the oscillation completely but you can uh, make things uh, better to an acceptable uh, level of performance right that's about it uh, for the notch filter any questions please Uh, any questions about the notch filter design? All right, so I think uh, you have understood it. Um, I think it's important that you type all these uh, MATLAB codes and practice yourself, okay? Right. All right, then uh, our next uh, discussion is uh, frequency design. Right. So, uh, so let us start the frequency domain design. Uh, so far, it has been uh, 
time domain design okay time domain design so uh, the response uh, we have always dealt uh, in the time domain so uh, if you look at the rise time the overshoot settling time they're all time domain uh, parameters okay so now it's a major change right uh, frequency domain design is like a fresh start so now we need to look at uh, things uh, somewhat differently somewhat differently uh, this uh, uh, is not uh, an easy change for many right because uh, um, most of the time you are too much into the time domain design right so therefore uh, frequency domain design is naturally not very really familiar to many right but if you uh, uh, give it an say a hard effort right and uh, try to look at uh, signals in frequency domain uh, this will open a new uh, uh, experience and much better understanding about systems and signals right rather than on time domain actually uh, the uh, the genuine uh, treatment of control systems or systems and signals has to be in frequency domain not time domain right so to for you uh, to, to help you understand how the systems work, right? So I have this uh, diagram. So what do you see here? Uh, you have you have um, the summing point. You have the reference. You have the response, and you get the error signal, and which goes to uh, one block here, G one. And after that, it goes to another block, G2, another one, G3, up to Gn, and gives out uh, the response to you. Okay. Now, if you look at uh, individual blocks here, individual blocks here, right? And also, whatever signal coming from this side, right? as a rotating phaser what is a rotating phaser it's like like this you have this arrow the real axis and you rotate it like this this is how you represent a sinusoidal waveform so if you rotate it at a slow frequency it's a slow signal and if you rotate it fast it is a, a high frequency signal so if you draw this on a timeline, it will go like this, a sinusoidal waveform, right? Because if you look at this uh, real part, so when you, when you rotate it, the real part reduces. When it is completely vertical, there is no real part. And after that, you have a real part again, but negative. And then when it vertically downward, again, there's no real part. Okay, and after that, you generate another real part which is positive. And when it comes to here, zero phase is uh, maximum, it reaches the P. So, I think you know this one, right? You know this one, you have done this uh, right from A level, and eventually you see your waveform like this, right? And how fast you rotate here tells your frequency. tells your frequency now this is what i'm trying th that's not what i'm i'm trying to teach you now when you have this kind of signal going uh, through a block like this okay g1s for example uh, this signal amplitude this length changes and also the phase changes that is all what we need to know. So, this particular signal, 
it is zero phase signal like this for example zero phase signal right you can start from the top or at zero doesn't matter right wherever you want to start the signal so after going through this block i can draw it like this which means this zero phase thing is now uh, ha has changed now there is a phase angle phi 1 j omega the signal is delayed a little bit and also the magnitude changes by a certain amount so this one single block introduces phi 1 phase lag and magnitude change earlier it was a magnitude a now this is a m1 which means different from a understand so therefore when you go to uh, this point and observe the signal you might see uh, something like this uh, a delayed signal maybe delay of this much and magnitude also different maybe something like this maybe something like this okay you can see the signal is delayed by some time time means the phase and also amplitude has dropped so this drop of amplitude this drop of amplitude from here to here is actually m1 the magnitude change as a percentage and phi 1 is this angle from here to here this angle now the interesting interesting thing is this magnitude change as well as the phase change they're all frequency dependent depending on your frequency right these are frequency dependent quantities how much you delay the signal how much you change the amplitude they're all frequency dependent frequency dependent so if you take one frequency which is omega you can calculate what is the phase delay what is the magnitude change but if you look at this G1, right, and also there are so many frequencies coming in. So G1 will take action against individual frequencies. If there are three frequencies coming, right, G1 will act on individual three frequencies and change the phase accordingly. So the three signals, three different frequencies will undergo three different phase changes and three different amplitude changes now with this new phase change or phase shifted waveforms with three different amplitudes will be the signal over here and when you go past the next block same thing will happen the second block it doesn't know what the original signal was it will take what is coming into the block and look at okay there are three frequencies right the frequency has not changed three frequencies and it will introduce three different phase delays to the three frequencies and also three different amplitude changes to the three amplitudes and it will go on so this is simply what is happening as the signal passes through a block like this individual blocks and eventually it comes out of here so if if there are many blocks like this and eventually you can see something like this there's a there's a big phase change total phase change phi j omega for that particular frequency okay and also am this m is the total magnitude change total magnitude change as this particular frequency passes from here to here 
So if I want to write the total gain, total gain, amplification or attenuation, amplification or attenuation, I need to multiply M1, M2 up to Mn, right? The total magnitudes. And the phases, I need to add them together. All the phase changes. By the way, as you know, uh, uh, if you look at uh, uh, the phase delay, right? Phase delay uh, is basically the time delay. As you know, I can write it over here. Uh, if I if I say time t is equal to uh, uh, what omega uh, sorry right uh, the phase right phase is equal to as you know, omega times t, right? Omega times t. So if you look at a single uh, frequency, omega, right? A single frequency coming over here, right? And if there is a time delay as, as it goes from here to here, right? T. So when you multiply omega t, it becomes a phase delay. Becomes a phase delay. So, when you say time delay and phase delay, they are not two different things. They are related one to one like this. So, sometimes I call phase delay, I, I call time delay. I'm talking about the same phenomena. Okay. All right. Now, if you look at the total open loop gain, right? for the entire pass from here to here, it is total capital M J omega for that particular frequency. It is pi one to N M I J omega. This capital pi means multiplication. You multiply M1, M2, M3, M4, M5 like that. You multiply every magnitude, okay? Of each, each block. Uh, now, if you want to, uh, uh get the total uh uh transfer function gain g j omega uh, in terms of db for example right so then you take the individual blocks magnitude in db and add them together so this is another discussion uh, um why don't you read a little bit about this decibel representation of gains, right? So pretty basic stuff. Maybe you have done it already or forgotten. Uh, go to the internet and look at some of the notes on uh, uh, the gain representation using dB. Then you will see, right? The gain is actually an ex exponent in, in terms of dB power. So when you multiply numbers like this, right? If you have these numbers raised to power, you just need to add powers together. So that is why in dB terms, you are adding them together. If you have a dB term over here, another dB term here, another dB term here, you don't multiply dBs, you add them together. But actual magnitudes, you multiply, right? So um, please do that little uh, uh, homework, right? How we represent magnitude of a block, right? In terms of decibel, okay? Uh, and uh, if you look at the phase, right, individual block has this phase, uh, phi i j omega, right? But if you have number of blocks cascaded, everyone introduces a time delay and a phase delay, therefore, time delay and a phase delay. So you have to add them together. So summation, one to n, right? And uh, if you look at the transfer function, individual transfer functions, this one, G1, G2, etc., uh, you can calculate the phase of individual block and add them together.
okay so this is the how the gain is calculated for individual blocks in terms of dv and add them together total dv and the phase individual phase of the blocks add them together the total phase right so that is the uh, uh, the fundamental uh, introduction to the phase domain right of rather frequency domain discussion so i have not uh, taken uh, any uh, particular content for today so that we will do next time next week uh, but i uh, explain only the, the the basic things that you need to know before you get going uh, with the frequency uh, discussion so any questions uh, about this uh, uh, power train or the uh, uh, frequency uh, signal propagation from input to the output through a series of blocks and how this total phase and total gain uh, is calculated. Any questions about that? All right, uh, then we will uh, leave it there. Uh, so uh, for this week, uh, there are a few things that we need to do. Uh, first one, I will upload the videos to the web uh, and also uh, class notes. Uh, I will check whether this number changes are there, whether all the uh, uh, lecture notes are there. I'll make that happen. Uh, and also I will upload uh, the assignment, the first assignment. Uh, you can work it out through the week and then uh, before the next class, uh, you can submit it to me, right? All right, so that's it for the day then. So I'll see you next week. Have a good evening. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you. Thank you.